Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Today we're talking about what it's like going through an accelerator, but this time from the point of view of a startup founder. If you'd like to know more about what it's like for an accelerator to pick companies, look for our episode with Erling Lim, one of the directors for the Southeast Asia region for 500 Startups. In this episode, you'll hear me talk with the founder and CEO of Audify, a company that uses no-code and artificial intelligence to help startups manage their resources for automating testing and maintaining test scripts, because this is a huge problem that a lot of companies have and there's a massive market for it. And you'll hear more about his story of how he pivoted and how he came to discover this. And it's something that the Accelerator helped him to realize. In general, he had a great experience with the Accelerator. And while I have no experience being part of an Accelerator because I chose a different path for my startup, that doesn't mean that there isn't value in working with an Accelerator as long as you choose the one that fits you the best. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ryu in this very brief but important episode packed with a lot of information. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Rio. Let's learn more about what it's like being part of an accelerator. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your startup now that you launched through being a part of the accelerator? I'm Rio. I'm a CEO of CEO and co-founder of a startup called Otify. So Otify is the uh, AI-powered software testing automation startup. So we automate the, uh, the software testing by AI. So we support the, uh, the web application testing as well as the, uh, the mobile native app testing. So that's what we are doing. We launched the service on October 2019. Uh, then we joined the, uh, the accelerator uh, back in 2018, August. Joined the accelerator called Alchemist Accelerator, which is based in San Francisco. They are focusing on B2B startup. Thank you for introducing Audify. And yeah, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you got the idea to join an accelerator and how you decided that Alchemist was the right one for you. And if you had applied for other accelerators as well, or... I had been thinking about joining the accelerator uh, because like, although I founded this company in San Francisco when I lived there, I went back to Tokyo, Japan. Then we are building the company from outside of the Bay Area Silicon Valley ecosystem. So joining the uh, accelerator would gain the uh, kind of access to the community in terms of like, you know, the network, like network of the other startup as well as the other investors and so on. I thought that joining the accelerator would definitely be one of the important things to make the other successful startup that scales globally. Like we've been applied to a lot of type of accelerator, not only Alchemist Accelerator, but also Y Combinator and the 500 Techstars and so on. And so you had said that you first started applying in 2016 for accelerators. It took you two years to get someone to say yes. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. I founded the, the company September 2016. So it's almost like a one year and a half. Were you actively applying during that whole time or did you wait until you had like a prototype before you started to apply or? I've been applying, you know, all the time, like, you know, even without the product and so on. So, so I actually applied the other, uh, Alchemist Accelerator twice and then I applied to Y Combinator, I think three times. Wow. So I'm writing a note right now, apply early and often. 
<laughs> yeah, apply iron and often. Yeah, that, that's actually the, the one of the important things. Yeah, they, they fail many, many times. I talked to a lot of like a YC alumni and then they say like, you know, they, they got rejected many times. They get accepted like after three times or four times, even like a seven times or something. You should apply many times. Do you think they reject people on purpose in order to test their resilience? Or do you think there's just too many applications? Like, why do you think people get rejected so often? I don't think they would test the resilience uh, of the founder. You could be accepted without any product, uh, without any client, so on. If you don't have any traction, you would be rejected. So that would be the reason, like, you know, too early. So when you got the acceptance from Alchemist, were you already in the U.S. or did you come from Japan just for the program? I was in Tokyo, Japan. So yeah, I went to U.S. to join the accelerator. So when they accepted you, did they make you pay an application fee? Did they pay for your flights? Like what, did, was there any benefit to being accepted or did you have to pay for everything yourself? The accelerator invest you, which means that you can use that money for the state. So when they say, hey, we've accepted you, give us your bank details and we're going to send you a check. Like, is it that, is that, it's that easy? Yeah. So like when you get accepted, okay, here's the money. So like it's already defined. How long was the program? Six months. And so you were committed to staying there for six months? Uh, not really. Like I, uh, I, I, w- I was actually going back and forth between Tokyo and San Francisco. So you don't really need to be there for like, you know, entire six months. What would you say was the hardest thing about starting the program? Was there day one boot camp and they're like, everything you know about starting a company is shit and you're an idiot and we're going to, was it like this Silicon Valley kind of brainwashing session? Like The most interesting thing was like one of the advisors said to all the other startup that I wouldn't get you guys on the stage if you don't have any customers, the stage of the demo day. So yeah, that totally makes sense, right? Because like we are B2B startups, even in the uh, early days, like if we don't have any customers, like if we don't have anyone who is paying for your technology, that would kind of tell you that, you know, your technology, your product is worthless. So that's what he was trying to say, I think. In the other six months, you definitely need to get paying customers. So was that a shock for you to hear that or was that just common sense? It's not really a common sense, but kind of shocked. You you just have a six months or something and we didn't have any live product yet. Then like we've been struggling for like a past one and a half year, almost two years. I was pretty motivated. Okay, we, we're going to definitely make it. What was the first really important lesson that you learned after that little shock you experienced? Uh, Ravi uh, is the head of Alchemist Accelerator. He mentioned the uh, two important things. So number one is solve customers' burning need. Don't create vitamin, create painkiller. The vitamin is kind of nice to have, but the painkiller is must-have. In terms of selling B2B technology, uh, the customer wouldn't purchase vitamins, like a nice-to-have product. They want their problem to be solved. So that's why like, you know, they only purchase painkillers. They don't have any budget for like nice to have things. And then the second one is aim for the big market. Like usually, you know, it wouldn't be winner takes all. The winner uh, would be like a worth like a more than $10 billion. But like the second spot or third spot, they could even you know, get IPO with like a few billions or like they can be acquired. Uh, so that's why even you couldn't uh, win in the, at the top of the market, you definitely have some success. Uh, so that's why like a market is the most important because like if you are not in the, at the large market, be, you, you're going to get stuck somewhere. You definitely cannot be uh, the unicorn. So because like the investors always thinking that, okay, if the startup can be a unicorn or not. So like to be a unicorn, you definitely be in the, the, the big market. I love how you expounded on the market side. 
but I didn't hear you talk about the pain point side. I mean, you, you kind of touched uh, on it slightly. So I'd like you to go a little bit deeper into it. You said that Robbie had said you need to solve people's burning needs and uh, off air, you kind of shared with me more about that. So I'd love to hear you talk about it again here so that everybody else can hear. So as I mentioned, like the customer wouldn't spend the money for nice to have product because like they need to solve the burning needs. So think that if the customer's hair is on fire, so you need to do something for this. To build a successful B2B business, the first step is identify the burning need. You shouldn't build anything without identifying it. So like we, we've been failing quite many times before joining Alchemist Accelerator uh, by starting from like building something without defining what our the burning needs. The alchemist forced us to sell right now, even without the product. So what they told us to do in the first week is actually like purchasing the uh, the LinkedIn sales navigator, then sending cold emails to prospects, then get the meeting, talk to the customer, trying to get like, you know, what are their problems? What are their pain points? Then identify what makes them burn their hair. What we did is try to sell the product even without the product. Like we are doing something different on the uh, testing automation space. So we've been like talking to uh, 70 to 80 customers already in the, uh, the first three months, but we couldn't sell anything. You would think like selling the, uh, the product without the product would be hard, but I think that's possible. Uh, talking to like a 70 to 80 customer and then couldn't get any positive reaction. I felt like something went wrong. So that's why like after the three months, we stopped there. Then we collected all the, uh, the feedback from the meeting note, created the uh, spreadsheet, then count all the, uh, the pain points that they mentioned. We found that there's uh, two main things that most of the company mentioned. Uh, the first one is hiring an automation engineer would be very difficult in terms of automating the uh, test. And the second is maintenance cost. Almost all companies mentioned that uh, maintenance cost is very high, really difficult to maintain the automated test scripts. That make us realize that, okay, if we could solve those two main things, it's going to be definitely uh, the big business. That's the moment that we could identify the burning needs. After that, we'll build that the sales pitch deck from the scratch based on those two burning needs. Then also like, you know, rebuild the other solution based on the, the two problems. How can we solve those two main challenges? Then like we come up with, okay, so no code to solve the, uh, the engineering resources problem because like, you know, anyone can automate with no code. So that's first solution. And the second is uh, AI to maintain the test code. So came up with the, the two main solutions, then build up the sales deck from scratch. Then also like at the same time, we build the, uh, the kind of like a really small mock-up. I mean, like just a demo video. It's not like a working product. Actually, like we done it one night. Then brought that to the uh, the next customer meeting. Then the reaction was totally changed. They said, okay, so we're going to buy this product. So like even with the product, right? The reaction is totally different. Like they, they start asking that, like, you know, when can you ship the product and then how much is it? So like the question be- became more kind of detailed. Before that, like uh, hitting the, the, the burning knees, they would say like, oh, it looks cool. Like, let me know once you build it. So like uh, you would get this kind of reaction many times, but like uh, that is kind of signal that like uh, you haven't identified any of burning needs. Yeah. So after identifying the burning needs and hit the, the right solution, the customer reaction would be drastically different. We closed a few contracts before the demo day and we successfully get up on the, uh, the stage of the demo day. Thanks for sharing your story. It's very interesting. And at least for me, I started a company and the thing I started actually ended up being something wildly different today, years later, before it even gets seen by any users. Mm. I think we all go through something like that. And so it sounds like the accelerator was a really good, positive experience for you and your company. Yeah, definitely it was. Of course, like, you know, in terms of yeah, learning the uh, the really important essence of building the uh, successful startup, but also like gain the uh, network of another startup founders as well as mentors and also investors. Was there anything bad about your experience? Mm, no, I don't have any bad things about joining the Alchemist Accelerator. 
So I'm, I'm glad that there was nothing negative because I've heard horror stories, but mostly around other accelerators that I won't name. So I'm glad that Alchemist has a good reputation. So the whole point of this exercise was to get onto the stage on demo day. How did you prepare for demo day? And what was the day like? Was it different than you expected? Did your preparations actually work? Two weeks before the, the demo day, I started to create the pitch deck. And then they have kind of rehearsal and feedback uh, session, uh, looking at the classmates pitch deck and then, you know, revising it, writing down the script, practicing it with the, uh, the classmates and so on. Demo day, that was actually like a bigger than I expected. The venue was so huge. There was like, you know, 300 to 400 investors, 4,000 people watched the stream. Of course, I was pretty nervous because like you, you would only have a four minutes, but it was very fun. I could make a good pitch. After the pitch, that not only the investor in the venue, but also like uh, the joining online, they, they have a mobile web app that has kind of like a button for each, each companies. Like, you know, if you want to invest in the company, you, you kind of like press the button. Okay, I want to invest uh, in this company or like I want to talk to this company. I got many emails. Then after that, like, you know, we aggressively like arranging the meeting, then you know try to like raise capital so yeah that was pretty busy after that how many meetings did you actually have and did you actually close any fundraising from those investors who emailed you who were at demo day yeah maybe like a 40 to 50 yeah i don't quite remember but yeah so after the demo day we've been pretty busy on like a scheduling the meeting and then having the pitch for fundraising for a month or something then after a month we to see, okay, so these investors will fit and then so, you know, uh, move on to the uh, next stage of like a due diligence or something like that. So after that, we successfully could raise the seed round financing, uh, which is the 2.5 million, but that actually took a time. So did any of those in the seed investors come from Demo Day? Turned out like, you know, we couldn't find any like good fit from the demo day, but uh, we could have uh, many opportunities to talk to a lot of variety of investors. So yeah, a lot of learnings, although we couldn't uh, raise any money from those investors from demo day. And there's nothing wrong with that because we all know that you have to talk to a lot of people in order to get money. Yeah. Do you feel like even though you didn't raise any money from the investors at demo day that after you finished with them and you started to raise from investors you didn't know yet, that saying you graduated from the Alchemist Accelerator, that that gave you any sort of advantage in raising funds? So like the reason why I uh, couldn't raise from the investors from Demo Day is like, you know, we decided to focus on the, the Japanese market first. I mean, after successfully launch a product in Japanese market, of course, like uh, aiming for the global market, most of the investors was like uh, US investors through the Demo Day, right? So that's why they would uh, say that, okay, if you focus on the Japanese market, like uh, we couldn't help. Then I went back to Japan and then, you know, talking to the, uh, the Japanese investors mainly. Everyone knows Ar Alchemist Accelerator, of course. Then, you know, like we were the, actually the first Japanese company graduated from the Alchemist Accelerator. So that helped us a lot. I know from our last conversation, you had mentioned thinking about expanding into the U.S. probably in 2022, I guess. Have you kept in touch with those investors who liked you but said no because you were focused on the, the Japanese side? Yeah, I keep in touch with those investors. How did you keep in touch with them? Did you create like a spreadsheet to manage every time you contacted every one of them? Or do you have a newsletter that you do? You just blast out information. How do you do that? We manage all the investors I contacted. Uh, on the uh, spreadsheet, then frequently like reach out to them and then say, hey, we hit this uh, milestone or something like that. So did you have any investors that are like, when you want to expand to the US, contact me? And that's basically it. They're like, we like you, but we need to see you come to the US. Basically, like the US investors are, you know, actively looking at the uh, testing automation space. Almost everyone says, yeah, let me know when you expand the business. So then how can people follow up with you? You can find me on Twitter with uh, the username Ryo Chikazawa. Send me the DM.
Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your story. If you liked this episode, definitely reach out to Ryu on his Twitter, which we'll have the details for in the show notes. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're struggling with your business, it might be time to consider checking out an accelerator. Thank you for your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.